Okay, all right. Let's have your questions and comments. Nicola? Well, first of all, thank you all for uh, for your presentations. It was a really pleasure pleasure to to listen to all of you. And uh, during all of your presentations, I had many questions that arose. So I would like to ask each one of you one question, if that that's fine. Uh, but I believe that the answers can be short, indeed. Uh, so uh, the the three of you on the right, so Nova, Katarina, and uh, Haris, the question is more or less uh, the same, or to at least some point similar. So in your research or in your coverage or uh, things that you uh, are interested in, uh, have you done some research on, let's call it, the other side? So Novak, in your case, the coverage of war in Kosovo from the Albanian side or the Kosovo, and how would those findings in those times differ from the Serbian coverage? Uh, Katarina, in your case, it would be the coverage of maybe even the same uh, cases that you did, uh, discussed here from other points of view. and. Uh, Haris, for you in particular, uh, have you interviewed anyone from the other point of view who would maybe and uh, discuss things that are similar? Or what do the other people remember from the other side, so from Croat or Serbian? Do they remember Vjechnica or they remember some other things? Uh, and finally, Elisa, to you, because you make a distinction between Bosniak and Bosnian, and th this is a some sort of an issue that we here and as archivists have while watching um, the, the tapes from Bosnia and Herzegovina from those times. So where do you make in your research the cut point or how do you separately divide those two in, in, in your research? So thank you and sorry for taking this much time. Uh, I have to friendly ask all the panelists to be very yes. concise. Yeah. Uh, no due to the simple reason because Kosovo Albanians did not have their own TV station. And even if they do, I don't speak Albanian, fortunately, so I really don't know how valuable it all would be. Um, actually, uh, no, due to sources. I would love to do the same thing for the same cases in Bosnia and Croatia, but it seems to be impossible to get sources or TV in these uh, cases or very hard. But I did that in the book uh, where I did press, where you can actually find the sources. And uh, there are d different uh, strategies of creation uh, national identity as based on the, uh, ICTY. The, I the, did some analysis of some six cases, always comparing like Milosevic in Serbia, Milosevic in Bosnia, Milosevic in Croatia, or I don't know, Gotovina in Croatia, Gotovina in Serbia. So comparing really completely different uh, reproductions and there are huge differences and basically my conclusion was that ICTY judgments was, were subjected in Bosnia to victimhood uh, narrative, in Croatia to winner's narrative and in Serbia to defense. This is like simplified but basically that was conclusion. So completely different, um, yeah, discursive. Uh, well, I think you can use this one. Is it on? Uh, thank you very much for your question. So. Um, if you, I don't know if you remember or, or, or uh, paid attention to the name of the woman I, you know, whose experience is described. Her name, she's Tana. She's not a Bosniak woman. She lives in Bistrik. She did, she's a Sarajevan. So I'm not interested, even though there's a lot of focus on ethnicizing or kind of uh, trend to ethnicize every single story. I'm interested in particular in survivor stories. Uh, and uh, when, it, when it came to talking about uh, Vjechnica, for example, I was interested in people who had effective relationship with that building, both before uh, the, it was destroyed, when it was destroyed, and you know their memories of it. Um, I, in my other research, in, you know, anthropological kind of classical field work, I've done uh, uh, work uh, research with uh, displaced people from Western Bosnia who live now in, in Eastern Bosnia, Serbs from Glamoc. And their stories are very similar to, to those of displaced Bosniaks. So I try not to ethnicize, but I, at the same time, I'm not looking for the other story, for example. I don't go to, when I write about, uh, in, talk about Srebrenica, I do interviews with mothers of Srebrenica. I also accompany them to see what they do. I don't necessarily go to uh, see how people in Kravica would uh, see Srebrenica, because it's a kind of dangerous terrain, to, and especially for someone who is an insider, kind of, it's a uh, no, but it's not just uh, you know it's ethical, not just judge the interest of the time. I'm an outsider as well as in, an insider, 
but I don't want kind of to get competing narratives that in order to weaken one dominant uh, uh, truth, not necessarily story or narrative. Uh, yeah, we, well, we can talk more about that later. Okay, so the difference between Bosnian and, uh, and Bosniak. Um, so, as I said, in sort of everyday, you know, usage, there's almost there's there's often no difference. It's very difficult to draw the line, right? But for my purposes analytically, um, I'm looking at Bosniak as a kind of ethnic narrative, where especially um, as sort of put forth by, you know, Izabegovic's party, the SDA, or you know, and and really arguing for a, a prominent role of Islam in ethnic, you know, in Bosniak identity, right? And there are of course competing. Um, conce conceptualizations of Bosniak identity, but then the Bosnian uh, identity, um, and you can see in maybe the, the the debates about the recent census that was there, which we still don't know anything about, probably never will. Um, <laughs> but you know the the category of other and and whether Bosnian could be um, a category, and that that you know so there were advocates of Bosniak identity who were really arguing very strongly against you know don 't put Bosnia in you 're going to dilute the, the 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 identity of you know our collectivity, but there are people so Bosnian is are people who insist first of all on a secular identity regardless of their own relationship to religion, but um, on an identity that 's citizenship based that 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 looks to Bosnia Herzegovina as a state it, it's it's implicitly and explicitly resisting um, secessionist narratives of, of exclusive, you know, ethnic identity and, and, and the war violence of especially Serbs and Croats, but then there are some parts of Bosniak identity that, that um, construct that difference very, very clearly as well. Um, all right, I think I have a, a general comment and um, a couple of questions. I'll try to be as quick as possible. Um, general comment really relates to, um, I guess, a, a problem certainly I'm personally experiencing, wor experiencing wor working in the UK and trying to do still some work on, you know, the former Yugoslavia um, or Eastern Europe more generally. And it has to do with the fact that, you know, in the UK realistically and probably elsewhere as well, the interest is rapidly declining in anything that has to do with that, yeah? So, but I think, you know, the panel that we just heard really raised some issues that, you know, can help us perhaps think about how we can be strategic as academics interested in, and, and you know, researchers and maybe also N NGO workers interested in these topics, how we can make these problems relevant and heard outside of our little, little circle. And there's two topics in particular that you've discussed in various ways. One is um, the role of the visual, and the second is the role of memory. I mean, these are very obvious topics. So I guess it's just a question perhaps for us all for later in the afternoon when we, when we have the workshops. How can we perhaps mobilize these issues uh, to think about future projects that go beyond Yugoslavia and make us understand, you know, questions such as what is the role of the iconic images in the creation of memories, not only nationally but also transnationally, yeah? So what makes one particular iconic image or a broadcast travel and be remembered to these days, even in the UK? So, you know, somebody like the image of, of Fikret Alic, for instance, is still there. Yeah, in the public domain, also in the UK, partly because of the Daily Mail, so things like that. And the second question might be the role of emotion, and especially positive emotion, I think, in propaganda. And I think we tend to forget about that a little bit when we deal with nationalism, because there's so much talk about hate speech and exclusion and um, uh, representations of violence. But I think what really triggers things and make things work is, you know, images such as those that. We, we saw in uh, some of the Novak's presentation, yeah? so the images of love, uh, safety, belonging, loyalty. I mean, this is what you know, makes people really tick and survive something like a war. Now, I know these are sort of um, you know, very, very broad uh, things. And now to, to my two questions. Uh, one is for Katerina. Am I right to understand that you did also some audience research? Or, so if you, if you did, if you, if you could say a little bit more about that. And for Halil, I was wondering 
whether you could tell a little bit about how you think the arrival of social media has changed the dynamics of memory um, mm -hmm. in post-war Bosnia and Herzegovina. So what, what's happening now with these memories? Mm -hmm. Whether you know, there's any change? Thank you. Uh, thank you for both comments and the question. And yes, uh, as for the comment, we really need to, like, all together, because we need, I think, to go over the region and to expand this into uh, other uh, topics and places. As for the audience uh, research, I wouldn't really call it audience research. We did uh, six discussion groups with uh, students in Belgrade, uh, it was, and we also had uh, 78 uh, survey uh, questionnaires uh, that also students uh, filled, so we do have some kind of feedback what was for them, how they perceive uh, trials, and uh, although they are very critical toward media, saying that media is propagandistic, manipulative, and da da da, they reproduce to the last detail uh, media presentation of war crime trials. So this is, I think, the most important, but we are currently working on that paper, so <laughs> it would be a separate publication. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your question and, and uh, introductory comment. Um, well, social media uh, has changed or continues to change, continues to change uh, memory and, and, and narrative about uh, many places in Bosnia, and I'm particularly interested in, in local places, in places that do not exist very often in, rea in real geography. So many of these places have been reconstructed in, on the internet, so I call them cyber villages. For example, the village of Repa, which was you know, destroyed in 95, you know, along Srebrenica, it hardly exists as a village anymore, or cluster of villages. But if you put in the Google search engine Jepa, you will get on Jepa Online, which is a vibrant uh, website with, you know, the bridge still as it was just built, even though I've got the, the pictures from the bridge now, which is completely, you know, neglected in ruins, just uh, not in ruins, but it's vegetation overgrown, over, it's, it's not used, it's not alive anymore, the, the famous bridge on, you know, on, Jepa, on the river Jepa. Um, but on the internet, there is, uh, it's a, it's a it serves as a memory site to the village. So there are collections of photographs, which kind of it's a kind of open repository where people from different places, you know, from Jepa, uh, submit and upload their pictures and share. And this is not a, the only example, but I'm just choosing to talk about Jepa because really it, the place doesn't exist out there in eastern Bosnia. However, on the internet, it does exist as a memory site as a very much kind of vibrant place. Uh, you will learn there about people who passed away. You will learn you know, about uh, events that happened in, in uh, communities like one is in, in um, Jackson, somewhere in, you know, near Atlanta, one in St. Louis, in, you know, th th these communities, what they do there. Um, and if you kind of, as an as a, as a ethnographer, if you engage with both the place out there, plus with the local, very, very specific culture, you can read so much on that website. So it's, uh, for example, the name of a person who died and then, you know, her surname and her first name. Um, it can tell you so much that you wouldn't be, you know, I mean, just the website wouldn't tell you without the context. So someone named Mushka who passed away at, her, you know, at the age of 83 and her surname is that, you know. What does, you know, Mushka is a woman's name which means you know, male something, like it's hard to translate. But in the local culture, they, it was given to women, in the, you know, it's a kind of part of superstition and kind of pre-Islamic, pre pre-Christian beliefs possibly, that are still, you know, that still are still alive. And these women, women uh, uh, parents that didn't have a, a son for many, I don't know, one, two, three children, they would then give name to their last born uh, girl, Mushka, uh, in a kind of, as an act to please whatever powers to have uh, the next um, child to be a male. So you have a lot of mushkas from Jepa. Not anymore. They are dying off. They are not, they're not going to be mushkas anymore. But they are still, you can find, there's a kind of, it's a, a, a ethnographic engagement with that website as, as um, you know, Ildiko said yesterday, is, you know, it's not engaging with something that's out distant there because you as a researcher, Ref, you know, include all your knowledge, all your reflections, and then do double checking with 
uh, people in reality and also places there. So that the social media continues to, to influence that. And it's not just communicating uh, through Skype and having coffees in real time, you know, sitting in Vienna and then in St. Louis, but it's uh, actually the websites that exist out there. So if you go on JEPA online, you will find a lot of this, what I'm talking about, and much more. Yeah. We take uh, two more questions, two quick questions, and then reserve all your comments for the workshop, please. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for Katarina. You mentioned that the way we report on the ICTY trials, and especially if we have an honest reporting on the trials, can lead in a way to reconciliation when we think about the issues concerning the war. So now, 20 years after the conflict, when we think historically about this discourse of reporting on the ICTY trial, where can you say that we stand on this issue of reconciliation? Especially concerning the discourses of victimhood on one side and uh, winners on the other side, in any case. Yes, and th th this question would also be to Katarina Ristich about uh, the institutional background of the uniformity of your stories, of the stories that you mentioned. I mean, whether this is editorial policy, this is strict political control over government and private television, so where does it come from, uh, this striking uh, uh, uniformity? and uh, whether there are any dissenting interpretations, not in writing and not in the small parts of free Serbian media, because I understand that there is, but, uh, but perhaps through media with a bigger reach. Or this is the exclusive way the majority of the Serbian public can inform about uh, ICTY verdict. So I don't know we can postpone that for a coffee break. I would just say that uh, all those enthusiastic ideas on reconciliation and what, why, uh, what war crime trials can do uh, didn't take into account many uh, obstacles. Uh, and I would mention one, just one, which I think is extremely important, and that is immaturity of international humanitarian law and its application, which is still unable to univocally address the same atrocities. And that is something which came out from many uh, judgments, and that is something that lawyers are doing, and we still don't know what is the rule on how many meters of grenade is civil um, civil target and when not, and this is a basic. How do you have trials if you don't know that? And even Gotovina trial, we still don't have that. So humanitarian law is develop uh, developing, we are getting new rules, but we are far from consistent univocal legal system which could be applied. And this is just one. There are many other obstacles, but I will keep it here. Uh, as for the institutional background uh, of um, TVs, um, these are three most popular, let's say, TVs uh, in Serbia, which, I, uh, which we analyzed. One is uh, national state-owned RTS. Uh, the second one was Pink, uh, private-owned, mostly entertainment, but changed after 2000 into this kind of more supporting than current opposition or DOS uh, forces, which is, again, questionable, but let's put it like that. And B92 was the one that uh, everyone expected to do this great dealing with the past job because they were this uh, great oppositional uh, media throughout the 90s. Uh, I don't think this is a matter of any kind of pressure, political pressure to do this kind of reporting. Actually, I had interviews with journalists, most prominent of few of them, who really did cover ICTY trials for a long time, like Miloš Milic, Ljubica Gogic, and so on. And uh, they said that they did the best objective and neutral job that they can. And when I asked how about why we don't have victims, they said it's not true. I don't know how to interpret that 
I mean, I really don't. I'm still struggling with this answer, but this is the answer I got from all journalists who were doing that. And either they have some other news that I didn't see, or it is so naturalized that it is not perceived as such. I, I don't know how to interpret that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you, panelists. Thank you all. Uh, we are closing this session, and it's time for coffee break. <laughs>